Okay, hello everybody and welcome to the second presentation in the virtual history series presented by the Baltimore Architecture Foundation and Baltimore Heritage. This is Nathan Dennys of the Baltimore Architecture Foundation speaking again from my home in Woodbury. First, thank you to everyone who donated to be with us today. Your support at this crucial time allows us to push forward and deliver engaging content such as this series on architecture, history, and preservation. Before I introduce Tom, I'd like to plug the next in our virtual series program. Next up is uh, Pool and Hunt to Clipper Mill, a history of adaptive reuse. I hope you will join me on May 15th as I take, a, take us on a virtual tour of the Clipper Mill site in Woodbury and tell the story of how the site has been developed and adapted over its 170 year history. Now I'd like to introduce Tom Liebel. Tom is Vice President with Mosley Architects, Chair of Baltimore City's Commission on Historical and Architectural Preservation, and a BAF board member, to name a few of his many impressive roles. As an architect, Tom has over 20 years of experience and has won numerous awards, particularly for his groundbreaking work in adaptive reuse and historic preservation. Tom is also the author of the best-selling book, Industrial Baltimore. If you enjoy this lecture, I highly recommend picking up a copy. And also before we get started, a note about the Q&A. We'll have a brief Q&A at the end of the presentation. And the way it'll work is that you can put questions in the chat box in Zoom and we'll get to them at the end. And with that, I'll turn it over to Tom Liebel. All right, thank you very much. All right, uh, can you all see my screen? Yes. Awesome. So this uh, started out as a trying to capture the entire history of Baltimore's infrastructure, which I realized was an absolutely impossible feat. So instead, I narrowed it down to looking at just a couple small examples of uh, the history of the infrastructure here and uh, everyday objects you might come across and not realize that it's part of this sort of broader uh, tie into infrastructure. And as alluded to by the, the uh, title of the lecture here, let's... Uh, Let's, uh, let's get it here. Why are you not moving down? Oh, let's start with Rembrandt Peel. Um, early piece of infrastructure uh, was the fact that Baltimore had the first uh, gas distribution uh, utility uh, in the world, uh, and certainly in the United States. Uh, this is an example of his uh, rendering of his, uh, his famous ring of fire that you can actually now see. Uh, an example of at the uh, uh, Baltimore Museum of Industry. Um, but it really great, uh, gained great prominence that this notion of artificial illumination uh, was, was a spectacle that people come out and visit. And from that though, uh, what had been kind of a parlor trick ultimately became uh, one of the first utilities. Uh, and this is the, uh, the uh, first gas street lamp in America they, they like to build there, um, that it, um, uh, the initial gas distribution in the city was was run through cored out uh, wooden logs, which is hard to believe, but uh, somehow they were able to get enough gas through there to uh, uh, to power the street lamps. But this then became a much broader industry. Uh, I'm going to take one quick aside just because I was fascinated when I started doing some research on this. You know, everyone knows the the Peel Museum that at one point also was Baltimore City Hall, it's built in the early 1800s. Um, Early rendering here from back in the uh, middle 1800s. Uh, after that, it was a school. Um, just kind of look at the the picture here. Notice the uh, the kind of Tuscan style uh, columns at the at the entry portico here. Because what I found fascinating was old photograph of the building here. Um, just found, found you know founded by Rembrandt Peel, who started the uh, the, the gas distribution here. But um, you see this fairly simple building. Uh, clearly, like the initial rendering there. Uh, I had never seen this photo before, and I think a lot of folks would be shocked. Here's a shot from the, uh, <laughs> see, John's just cringed when, uh, when uh, this came out here. But um, I had no idea that this had been converted over to a commercial use. Um, and then, as we all know after that, uh, that the Peel Museum was renovated as part of a WPA project in the 1930s, and now has the, the looks the way it does today. But just recognizing that uh, the historic Peel uh, Museum that we see today has been so heavily modified, and I did not know it had been that substantially altered uh, until just the other night. But anyway, moving on with uh, Gasworks. Uh, this is an area of Baltimore called Spring Gardens, which is uh, 
down kind of where the middle river, uh, middle branch uh, comes into town here. And it was this big industrial uh, zone with lots and lots of uh, gas works there. If you see my needle here, you can see the, uh, the gasometers that were they sort of manufacture and store the gas to pressurize the system there. Uh, we're kind of all over the landscape there. There's a, you know, a couple power plants tucked away there with, of course, a couple of residences scattered in here, too. So the mixture of industrial and, and, and residential was, was really uh, you know, fascinating back in the day. And here's another shot from, uh, you know, the early part of the, uh, the, the 20th century, where there's this vast industrial complex uh, of, uh, you know, facilities to manufacture the gas, uh, coal gasification, and then the facilities to store and distribute it. Um, I'm not sure if everyone, you know, if you've been around Baltimore long enough, probably up until 12, 15 years ago, uh, you drive in on 395 and look to your right and you would see these amazing uh, gasometers, these big gas storage tanks um, that were, um, that were uh, there. And then uh, they were demolished. The last gasometer tank in Baltimore was actually up along I-83 in Woodbury area and was demolished just within the last 10 years or so. But anyway, as today, what we know is that's been, uh, uh, as these were demolished, then we now have these much more modest size vessels off 395. That is the remnant of the infrastructure of, uh, of the gas works there. But taking it back a little further, let's go back. This is a Sanborn map from 1890 uh, of uh, West Baltimore here. And you can see kind of middle there is a darkened triangle. That's the uh, Montclair shops. Uh, for the BNO Railroad, but in an area that was so abandoned, so or so sort of undeveloped that it hadn't even been validated to have a map number assigned to it to a Sanborn map, is this little area here, zooming in, of uh, the Chesapeake Gas Works. Um, that is, uh, a it's a complex, we'll see more in a second here, but it was where they were starting manufacturing and storage, um, uh, storing gas to distribute it. Um, here's one of the Bromley maps from 1906. You can see once again down in the bottom corner here, here's the site. And you can clearly see there's a couple buildings here um, that we'll study in a second here. But part of this broader street network, once again up here is the uh, Mount, uh, Mount Clair shops uh, for uh, the b &O Railroad. But, you know, surrounded by this almost residential area, but there was this major gas works. And what I also found fascinating is recognizing the scale that, that the uh, gas works had here, where we had the one area over there, but just over a little closer to the uh, middle branch. Let's look here, there's a consolidated gas company site over here, over here, over here, and over here. They kind of ringed an entire section of town. It was all dedicated to the production and distribution of gas. And once again, right next to it were all these amazing residential neighborhoods. And there's even the cross street market. You can kind of get a sense for for where we are right now, that it was just uh, how much of the space was, was dedicated to these, these truly industrial functions. So uh, 1901, here is a uh, Sanborn map. What you can see here, zooming in a little bit, uh, this is the area we're gonna study, kind of the corner of uh, Bayard and Wacomico Street. And you've got a couple of uh, sites here. Uh, this was the uh, uh, this office building and a, a, a meter house where they were distributing uh, the, the gas here. And over here was uh, the production complex, including uh, an amazing little building, the, the retort and generator house, surrounded by these gasometers. So they had these big storage tanks that would uh, stay, go there. And then across the street uh, was yet more space dedicated to that on the east side of Wacomico Street, north of Bayard. And then even south of there, yet more space dedicated, all this dedicated to uh, to uh, the manufacturing and production of, of gas and distribution of it. So then coming in a little bit later, uh, this is 1914. You can zoom in here a little bit. You sort of see, here's these same buildings again, only all of a sudden what had been the retort uh, house now is a foundry for the Baltimore Gas Appliance Manufacturing Company. It's no longer associated with the gas works. Yet the distribution site is here and the, gas, the gasometers are still here. So it's still used in production, but one half that site had already been uh, sold off by the gas works and, and converted to something else while keeping the old building there. And then across the street, uh, what had been more of the gas works was uh, the Baltimore Tube Company, a big tube mill. Then zooming in to uh, even later on, this is the 1950s Sanborn map here. You zoom in and you can sort of see the uh, same type thing where 
Uh, you've got the, uh, the meter house that's still functioning as that. Um, the site now is a parcel delivery station. So once again, completely transformed the use of the building. It was no longer used for man, you know, production of gasoline. It was the foundry. It was just another you know, storage building uh, with the gasometers still there. Um, and then across the street was the massive Revere tube works that it really expanded over World War II. You see this amazing complex built on the site that used to be uh, part of the gas works here. And then here we are today. Um, what's amazing is this is the site, the Carroll Camden uh, neighborhood. Um, how integrated into the broader community these really distinct individual buildings were, where there's the old uh, 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 meter house there, and there's the, uh, the retort house right there. And what you'll recognize it today is, you know, that was what uh, was, became Houseworks, an amazing example of architecture that was sort of dedicated to the prosaic effort of having a couple of valves to distribute gas, and yet there was such a, an architectural importance placed to it. And one of my favorite buildings in town, it, this is the old retort house on Wacomico Street. Um, that it's last used I'm aware of is used as a storage facility for a roofing supply company. I mean, just how, how uh, amazing is that, that this uh, awesome example of kind of Romanesque architecture is just sitting there waiting for, for a, a new life and a new purpose. Um, so that's gas. Now let's go on a little bit further and jump on to electricity. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the uh, Gould Street power plant, but it's one of my favorite uh, photographs from Aubrey Rodin. This is amazing moody night vision of uh, uh, the Gould Street station, which is right at the bottom of Key Highway where it intersects uh, at the harbor there. And it's just, once again, an amazing piece of architecture that it's easy to overlook if you just see it as a background building and don't look at it. But it's, uh, it's a, a impressive and actually architecturally thoughtful the way it's laid out. But I'm going to look at a much more modest neck of the woods here. Uh, we're going to go up. This is, a, once again, 1890 Sanborn map uh, up to um, Guilford Avenue right next to the train station. That's a site that we're all familiar with. But once again, tracking the change of this over time. A little area here that in 1890, it was mostly empty space. If you look at it, you had uh, the Maryland Screw Company and the Maryland Brass Company. Uh, metal seaming company, most of these kind of light scale industrial uses, with a lot of open site, and right next to it, all these residential properties. So you had this sort of, once again, interspersing of um, the industrial with the, um, with the residential uses here. So then let's move a little forward to, uh, once again, to, uh, to 1901 here. All of a sudden, Crown Cork starts to kind of step in here. It's now the kind of the era of the copycat building. We sort of see uh, a series of uh, dis individually distinct buildings. Um, you've got the uh, Coal Brass Manufacturing Company. Crown Cork took a chunk of the site there. Uh, there's these other sort of infill spaces and iron pipe storage shop areas like that. But once again, with that, all the uh, residential properties kind of shoved cheek to jowl right there. Um, uh, which had to be an amazing, you know, an amazing uh, to live on Latrobe Street facing into the side of this giant factory with the railroad just immediately to the south there had to be, uh, you know, some interesting living conditions. But then moving forward, this, you know, uh, moves up uh, to the 1920s. Let me zip in. Actually, 19, this is 1914. Sorry. Um, you see, once again, Crown Cork has taken over this entire site, including the construction of the uh, machine shop, which is now the Baltimore Design School. But they've sort of taken over almost all the entire site uh, with this large scale industrial site here. Although, oddly enough, still cheating in all these residences. So you had on Oliver Street, uh, just in the midst of all this, three residential dwellings just kind of hanging out uh, with all the factory activity around it. But then it gets interesting after this. And I'll get the infrastructure in just a second here. Look, this is the shop from the 1950s, um, where once again, you see similar space, similar layout here. Uh, the building that happened up here got demolished, but what we know today is the Crown Cork building or the copycat building is right here. Uh, you've got the, the what had been Lofts buildings. It was at, actually became LeBeau clothes for a while. Um, 
but then uh, built in 1917, so right after the last Sandbar map, is this amazing little piece of infrastructure here. It's an electric substation. Um, all of a sudden, um, right around the early 1900s, all these large factories started being becoming electrified, but had been either you know steam driven or water driven with these big belt takeoffs uh, to provide power to equipment. All of a sudden, everything got electrified. So guess what? They need electricity. So when you travel around to, to the site today, um, you barely see it. Here is, as you see, here's the, uh, the Baltimore Design Schools right over here. Here's the copycat building. There's a sort of contiguous little piece here. Looks like it all belongs. If you actually look at it, it even says it right there. It's a substation. It's completely, you know, separate building that's just sort of snuck in there that you would never know about it if, um, if you weren't uh, weren't looking out for it or weren't spending too much time staring at that sandbar maps. So that's just one modest example of the amazing uh, electric infrastructure that we have here. And uh, kind of a third chunk I'm going to look at here is um, water. And um, what's really amazing with Baltimore is it has been the leader in kind of clean water and sewers for well over a century. And um, as you're going to see, as we work through a couple of images, you're going to see here what we seem to have lost from time to time in some of these civic infrastructure projects is the celebration of what we as a uh, as 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 citizens can do here, what we as a, a as a culture have been able to do here. And uh, a great example for this would be when you go down to uh, the bottom of President Street and you have the old sewage pumping station. Uh, right at the corner of uh, President and 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 uh, and Pratt Street there, you have to recognize that 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 was an amazing piece of architecture that celebrated the fact that we had a sewer system that that was something to be excited and proud of, uh, and that that the, the the city could claim the right to be a very progressive, very advanced uh, uh, community, and that we had clean water and, and sanitation, and that really was unique 100 years ago. Uh, I think all too often we have become, um, uh, we, we, we've taken, we've we, we no longer take into account how important some of this vital infrastructure is just because we take it for granted and don't recognize the amazing investments that were made to get us to this point. So starting our journey on water, here we are at uh, the Montebello filtration plant, where once again, we, you know, they, they make pure water uh, to distribute. And, um, you know, way back in 1915, when they had the grand opening uh, of the filtration plant here, and I'm not sure if anyone else had the chance to, but uh, back in 2015, they had uh, an open house so that you could go and tour the filtration plant, which, if you're an infrastructure geek, was a really an amazing experience, um, but it's not usually open to the public, but this was a really big occasion here. And um, what you recognize is, is the, the amazing complex you have here. And what's been you know, built onto over time is, you know, kind of here's the filtration plant, here's some of the selling tanks they have. Uh, there's actually in the front yard here is an amazing, um, I've never seen photos, I'd love to get photos of it, a, a grotto uh, uh, where they do all this water storage under the front yard there, uh, like uh, the cisterns you'd see in, 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 uh, in, in Europe. But uh, anyway, so here's just one example of this amazing infrastructure that's been built out uh, over time. But then kind of look, going through the history of how this all interconnects here, it's, uh, it's interesting in that here's once again the, one of the Bromley maps from 1906. You see here is Lake Montebello up here. This is actually before the um, filtration plant was built, but it was still already built as a receiver to bring water in. And they kept the water here uh, to start to, to prep it. And it was actually connected by a large tunnel down to Lake Clifton, where it was another distribution reservoir. So you see, you know, this is, you know, they they excavated Lake Montebello right here, but then buried under all this is this amazing other piece of infrastructure that you never see is the tunnel that was all hand laid brick right here that allowed the water to flow um, underground from Lake uh, Lake Montebello down to Lake Clifton. And here's Lake Clifton in the same period of time. Um, you know, what's interesting is here's Lake Clifton. You'll see in a second, here's the valve house. This is Johns Hopkins summer estate here. Um, this was uh, another important piece of um, civic infrastructure that over time, uh, the, the, 
the need for the lake uh, went away. But back in the day, here's a shot of Lake Clifton uh, looking over to the amazing valve house that um, you know you see was once again this was just a prosaic building that had a series of gates that allowed water to flow from one distribution site to another. You cannot have a more prosaic, more mundane use, and yet we have em embedded uh, a great deal of significance in the architecture we, we placed on it. And, uh, and here it is today. Uh, at one level, uh, quite tragic, as, as decayed as badly as it has. On the flip side, you look how well it was built and that this thing has been abandoned for a number of years. Uh, you can see right there, it says Lake Clifton right there. Um, 1887, tucked away up there. That, that's been abandoned for all this time, and yet um, it still hasn't fallen down and is an opportunity that potentially that we can uh, bring it back to some of its glory and, and repurpose it as we've done with so many other pieces of infrastructure. And then once again, here's this, here's kind of the site today where what had been Lake Clifton is now Lake Clifton High School, but it was infilled there. Uh, but then, you know, here's the valve house and there is the Mount Bell filtration plant. And you can sort of see the route they had to travel underground to get from one, you know, one of the uh, reservoirs to the other. And then once again, for bonus points, you know, there's Johns Hopkins Summer Estate. So if you can um, check that out one of these days. Um, and then also I want to talk a little bit about is um, the legacy that Baltimore has uh, worldwide for uh, its um, early adoption of, you know, water filtration and purification was led by a certain individual named Abel Woolman. Um, Baltimore born, uh, went to Johns Hopkins, became internationally re you know, renowned for his uh, civil engineering feats and uh, cre creating um, uh, clean water distribution systems. And he's the only civil engineer I know who has achieved such stature and such prominence that they actually named a major building after him. You know, once again, downtown, right next to City Hall is the Abel Woolen building. Uh, dedicated to a guy who basically brought world-class infrastructure to the city of Baltimore. And uh, to wrap up with kind of a couple of last items here, this is just a fascinating uh, piece of uh, work here. This, we're gonna look at the uh, Lake Roland um, water distribution down to the city of Baltimore that was originally engineered in 1862. Number one, it's another piece of our, of infrastructure that you don't just you never really pay a lot of attention to, but also just the I, I love the uh, the documentation of the, the map on this. So here's a it's it's a it's a plan, it's a section, it's details. There's lots of amazing things they embedded all in this single map uh, from uh, you know the Civil War period. But starting at the, at the north end of the lake here, uh, what happened on the Swan Lake and is now Lake Roland. Uh, covers uh, service 116 acres with 400 million gallons. Uh, the high service Hamden Reservoir had eight acres of water containing 50 million gallons and the Mount Royal Reservoir, which is the low service reservoir, had five acres of water surface and contained 30, millions of gall 30 million gallons. But this is now, you know, Lake Roland Park. And for those of you who've been up there to walk your dog or, you know, take a walk in the woods, you know, there's the dam and the uh, up around there was also the gatehouse and a waste weir that controlled the flow of water um, through this amazing system of uh, pipes and tunnels and conduits. Uh, there's a shot from back in the day, uh, looking along Lake Roland to the uh, valve house, right at the very top here that controlled uh, the dam there. And you can sort of see after that, here it is today. Uh, if you go up and visit it, it's this amazing, um, little kind of Greek temple tucked away there that says you know, very clearly on it, you know, Lake Roland from 1861. Uh, and it's something that if you don't go, go out of your way to look for it, you would completely just not even see it. It's tucked away in the side there. And with that also then is this amazing dam that is uh, uh, holding back Lake Roland, which is slowly sedimenting, but um, it still serves as a dam and still feeds the uh, uh, Jones Falls here. But the, uh, water conduit was eventually shut down just because they had better water supplies from other areas coming in when they brought up uh, Pretty Boy, 
and Lock Raven Reservoirs and um, Liberty Reservoir, uh, this became unnecessary. And they found that the, the uh, Jones Falls water becoming more and more contaminated. But back in the day, you traveled down a ways, you traveled down along uh, the Falls Road, um, along this, once again, series of tunnels and conduits, and you'd end up uh, at Harper, at the Harper Waste Weir, which was, uh, sounds like a, a modest little uh, element here. Uh, and looking at, once again, the, the, my fascination of the drawing is, they actually work through details of how you tunnel through hard rock, through soft rock, and an open exclamation, uh, excavation, and ultimately run in an embankment where you were above grade, they still wanted to mound over to protect it, so you had this embankment detail on the lower right there. But uh, anyway, you had the Harper Waste Weir, which is this modest little building over here. Once again, you look at this little temple theme. Uh, looks like a little baby brother to the Lake Roland, um, or Swan, you know, Swan Lake um, valve house up there. And this is just a little, uh, a little control complex here um, that it still exists today. If you ever visit Cross Keys, you drive in the main entrance there, look to the right, there's a little tiny, looks you know, like uh, someone should be buried in there or something like that. But this is that, that control weir. And you see the mound there, that is that embankment, that, that, that conduit that they built to run the water through. And actually the valves are still there, they still work. Um, but you can see once again, built in 1860, that's just sitting around and uh, uh, there to go visit. Then going further down this tunnel, going along the Falls Turnpike Road into the village of Hamden, uh, you have this amazing line here up to the Hamden Reservoir. And you look at here, you have this water line coming down here through the tunnel. Uh, you then had the influent chamber uh, and you had the effluent gate. Uh, and this is where uh, the water was brought in, set to the reservoir, and then prepped for routing further downhill here. But what you see then, once again, going to the Bromley map, here's the Hamden Reservoir. And what you have tucked away here is this little tiny, um, the, the effluent gate there, which uh, sounds rather, once again, a piece of prosaic architecture, not that big of a deal. Um, here it is right here. And then you see here's the lake across, uh, the view across uh, the reservoir here, which is, um, and there's the house um, oh, owned by the Carroll family, I believe. Uh, that is now where the SPCA uh, has their headquarters there. There is the uh, gatehouse right there. That today is the spay neuter clinic. That um, you drive up to the side of it and say, oh, look, it's kind of a cool Greek temple old building here. Then you turn to the side and actually see, it says right there, Hamden Reservoir, that this is uh, another part of the infrastructure that was repurposed um, to, uh, to become a new use. And if you didn't look for it, didn't know what it was, you would completely overlook it. And then going a little further down hill, hill once again, uh, what had been this, you know, this sort of gravity-fed flow, uh, here's the Hampton Reservoir on the bottom left over here, actually became a pipeline, uh, became a siphon, in that you had to go down and back up. You had ducked under the Jones Falls there, and then ultimately fed the Mount Royal Reservoir. So if you ever heard of Reservoir Hill, there was a reason for that. There was actually a reservoir there. This was uh, the, the reservoir that fed the north part of the city for a long time, um, where once again, you can see here, um, here is the Jones Falls coming down. This is North Avenue right here. This is kind of the gateway now where you, where you roll onto I-83 off of here. Here's Druid Lake, which was set up as another uh, water facility second here. But there was this amazing little reservoir that's since been infilled, but was the distribution point for a lot of water uh, throughout the north end of town that goes all the way up to the county, up to, uh, to Lake Roland. And then Druid, uh, uh, Druid Hill Park is an interesting study too, because in the end, here we have, it's a map of, this is actually a map of the picnic grounds. But what you also have here is, here's the reservoir tucked away on the side over here, uh, the, uh, the Mount Royal Reservoir. We all know about Druid Lake, uh, which was another large scale uh, water reservoir, which is now being modified to be, and have a chunk of it being put in a tank underground due to new uh, environmental requirements. But there's also another high reservoir tucked away further on the park over here. So 
while this was a, a, a pleasure park that was designed for picnicking and the zoo and all that kind of things, there was all this infrastructure embedded throughout that. And then just sort of closing on water here, a couple of images here I think is fascinating is, this is a map from the 1950s that talks about where Baltimore gets its water and um, some of the details feeding it. Um, it's also just kind of a cool map. But then a couple of things that I was examining it that was fascinating is zooming out to the west, here's Liberty Reservoir. And you see there's another underground pipeline that runs out to Randallstown. And you have this high, you know, high space here that then feeds all the way down into the city. That's our feed from Liberty Reservoir. But even more interesting is zooming in, uh, looking to the north here, here's Lock Raven Reservoir. And you see what ties into this. You have these pipes uh, that run through here. You've got the uh, Lock Raven to Montebello Tunnel, and you've got the Gunpowder River to Montebello Tunnel that all run through from this area, feed down here, and then feed into Lake Montebello and Druid Lake. And there's the Guilford Reservoir over here and Lake Clifton down here. There's all this amazing bits of infrastructure that are all buried underground that we never see and yet supports the way we live here in Baltimore. And so with that, I'm pretty much through half an hour in a quick turbo here. So um, here we go. Um, questions? Let's hear them. And if you have any questions, by all means, please reach out uh, to me. I'd love to talk more about this. Thank you, Tom. This was a fantastic presentation. We have a few questions in the chat box. The first one is, where is the first gas lamp light located in Baltimore? Uh, it is down near City Hall. It is actually right near the Peel Museum. Great, and can you explain how the copycat building got its name? Um, I believe that it was, um, copycat was, was a printing company and, uh, and after it became, after Crown Cork moved out in the uh, 30s and 40s, um, those loft buildings had a lot of uses, one of which was the copycat company. Great, and I have another question. It's, it's referring to the copycat building. It says, uh, referring to the substation adjacent to today's copycat building, was it a consolidated electric substation or a United Railways and electric company substation? Uh, consolidated electric. Um, that's, you know, had I had another, you know, four hours, I could have gone into the, uh, the you know, United Railways infrastructure, the, uh, the streetcars, uh, there's, there are so many different things that we can look at here. This was sort of a first, uh, first sampling of it. There's a whole nother, uh, whole nother, actually a whole other chapter in my book about railroads and, uh, and even the, the, the cable cars too, and uh, street cars. So yes, uh, but the, that substation was not related to uh, the rail lines, but rather to electrical distribution. Okay, next question is, uh, when did Swan Lake change to Lake Roland and why was the name changed? I do not know. Great question though. I, I, I have no idea. And I'm going through to find some Sorry. questions. <laughs> I mean, not knowing is a good answer too. We <laughs> you can't know everything. And the next question uh, is, is the underground tunnel between Lake Montebello and Lake Clifton still extant or in use? Um, I believe it is. Um, it is not in use because it used to connect to Lake Clifton, which now has a high school sitting on it. But uh, I have been to the Valve House and you can look down there. There's a large pit uh, and you can see where tunnels go out and they've been sealed off. But uh, I do not know why you would actively demolish a tunnel uh, if you didn't have to. That'd be a very expensive proposition. So I would surmise that is still there, but is not used. And how much of our water infrastructure is still in use and what shape is it in? Uh, a great deal of it is in use. Uh, when you realize that we have uh, reservoir connections to Liberty, Pretty Boy and Lock Raven. Uh, we also have uh, connections out to the gunpowder and we have after the 1950s, uh, they built one, we have one that goes all up to the Susquehanna, I believe. Um, and here's my take on infrastructure. Uh, a lot of it's failing, as we know, that we've seen that there's been a, a fairly significant effort to replace a lot of water lines uh, in Baltimore in the last 10, 15 years. Uh, be, but that's not because it was built poorly. 
how many other things can you bury in the ground for a hundred years and have it survive and have it have it continue to function? I mean, it's just amazing um, that we built with the durability in mind that these amazing buildings, these structures, these tunnels um, have seen little to no investment for well over a century. And they're still there. If you look at the um, the, uh, the buildings associated with, with uh, Lake Roland down to uh, the uh, Mount Royal Reservoir, those things have been around, been around 150 years. And they're still there, still doing something. Uh, so uh, I think one of the things that concerns me about the future is that we don't always build the same level of durability, resilience, and duration in mind uh, for new works. And um, I, I am more confident that a building or a piece of infrastructure that's 100 years old now that was built to last will be here 100 years from now than something built today. It just, it's, you know, they were built to an extremely high, high standard and we should, you know, thank our, our, our forebears for uh, dedicating the, the time, uh, talent, and, and, and money to actually build this really amazing, robust infrastructure. And next question is, there is a balancing reservoir at Lock Raven near Cromwell Valley Park. What was its purpose? Balancing reservoirs, I'm, I'm not a civil engineer, but um, I do believe it is used to control flow between reservoirs, especially as you, everything's gravity fed and that you are trying to manage flows that are basically, the higher up you are, the higher head pressure you have, the more pressure you have pushing down uh, to the lower reservoir and that the bouncing reservoirs are used to uh, even up the pressure throughout the system to get an even distribution of water and not too much but if there's any civil engineers out there who could correct that, um, correct me for that, that would be awesome. And our next question is, what was the standpipe building for? I do not know what the standpipe building is. So if someone, I see that text come up. If someone, uh, yeah. if someone can text, you know, explain which, what building you're talking about, I could try and answer it or say, I don't know. And here's an interesting one. It's someone whose neighbor grew up in Roland Park and was exploring through tunnels as a kid around Cross Keys. Could those have been the water tunnels? Uh, quite likely um, that there, um, you know, that there were, um, there is this sort of conduit that runs through and it's actually been sort of chopped up in pieces because you now have the entry road that kind of runs, runs through there. Um, there was also interesting, just because I was playing the Sandborn maps the other day, there was a whole other well complex on the grounds of the Baltimore Country Club, which I don't think would have been tunnels, but um, early in the 1890s, uh, there was a whole different water supply that was pulled up from, uh, from uh, basically the, what was the golf course at that time, um, west and north of the clubhouse was, uh, was a well field, which now today is just this big open green space where people uh, play Frisbee and uh, run their dogs. Good sledding hill too. There's a bit more explanation about that standpipe building being at Roland Park and University Parkway. Oh, got it. Uh, that was the that was um, that's the, uh, the 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 water tower, the the Roland Park water tower, which was an early an earlier water distribution system where what the city did originally was they built these water towers. There's one in uh, at the corner of, of University and Roland um, that's being restored right now. And there's another one out on the west side that it's, 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 it's twin uh, that's a little more beat up. Um, but um, they would basically pump the water up there to create enough pressure to kind of push the water down. Uh, at later on, uh, the city went to, uh, to um, pressurizing the distribution system through a series of pumps and the water towers became superfluous. I, I have a question for you, Tom. So you think of industrial buildings, I, I think of them being like built for specific purposes and built very efficiently. So what makes them so great for adaptive reuse today? Uh, a couple things. Uh, one of which is they were just built robustly that they're, and um, a lot of them were Kind of big open spaces that you had you know big pieces of equipment in there things like that so 
it wasn't a, a they weren't to say rabbit warrens of small rooms that were dedicated to a specific function. So uh, the AIA's community environment for a number of years has articulated the concept of long life, loose fit. And in essence, they're, you know, they're decent sized buildings uh, that are robust, well built, uh, that don't have a lot of internal pieces that you have to work around. So they're ideal uh, for reworking, whether it's uh, infrastructure or old factories, uh, they're, they're ideal for repurposing because they are not so purpose built to a specific function that they can't be altered to be something else. Great, and someone is asking about your background. Where is it? Uh, my background, oh, um, <laughs> that is the, uh, the now long demolished uh, Penn Station uh, up in uh, New York City. Um, it uh, it was which was sort of the you know, it was one of the uh, key demolitions that really launched the preservation movement back in the early 1960s, and just an awesome piece of architecture. All right, I think that's all the time we have for questions. Well, there's there's one more that I could actually answer is where could you get your book? Well, we have it at um, at the AI Baltimore and BDF bookstore, and while we're not open right now, I'm sure that we could figure out how to get a copy to you if you wanted to say stick with going with an independent bookstore. And if, if you contact me, I'm even happy to sign it for you. Yeah. <laughs> and yes, the lecture will be posted online um, on the on our Facebook page, Baltimore Architecture Foundation, and on YouTube. And I hope everyone can make it to our, our next presentation in a couple of weeks. Um, I'll be talking about one industrial site in particular, the Pool and Hunt. Uh, complex here in Woodbury and how that's been adapted and changed over its nearly 170 year history. Uh, so thank you again, Tom, for joining us. Uh, it was my pleasure. Anyone has any questions, please reach out. All right, everyone. Goodbye. Have a great Friday. <laughs>